Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. Joining us today is Professor Joseph Fanacaro, better known as Professor Finn. Professor Finn is an esteemed colleague within the funeral service profession and the program director at Miami-Dade College's funeral service program. Welcome. It is a pleasure. Dan, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. So, Professor Finn, uh, this past Thursday, the FTC had an open meeting, and one of the items discussed was the advance notice of proposed rulemaking on the funeral rule. And they reviewed a staff report uh, in regards to shopping for funeral services online. The commission voted in favor four to zero on retaining funeral industry practices rule and issuing advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, They're looking to update and modernize the rule with improvements to public accessibility of funeral home pricing. Very specifically, the hot topic was putting pricing on the Internet. Um, Now, obviously, that's something that could be both beneficial for the public, but detrimental to the public as well. What are your thoughts on that? My initial thought is the FTC is focusing that that would be something along the lines of an unfair practice. And they do have the ability to regulate unfair practices. Uh, That has been very well established. Interestingly enough, if you go and you look at the original Federal Trade Commission rule in 1984, it states in the objective, like why this rule is coming into existence. And I'm quoting the Federal Register from back then. The evidence indicates that a significant number of funeral providers require that consumers purchase prepackaged funerals, many of which include goods and services that they would not otherwise purchase. They misrepresent, funeral practitioners misrepresent either directly um, or by the failure to disclose material information, require that consumers who wish to arrange direct cremation services purchase a casket for use in those cremations, embalm the body of the deceased without first obtaining specific authorization to do so, refuse to discuss or fail to discuss price information over the telephone, which is important because at that time, telephones were probably the main and only source of communication. Now that we have the internet, you know, that could be added to that. So, um, And the commission has concluded that these acts and practices are unfair or deceptive within the meaning of the section. Is it unfair that a consumer cannot go onto a funeral service website and see pricing? And in the larger category of everything, is it really unfair they have to call someone to talk to them to discuss the pricing, to see what, you know, the total package or whatever it's going to be. I think, yes, it is beneficial that consumers get some information on a website, whatever that might be. In the, um, in the report that they put out uh, entitled, I think it's Shopping for Funeral Services Online. Yeah, Shopping for Funeral Services Online, uh, which they released immediately after the meeting. Uh, I was could not find it prior to the meeting, even though it was referenced on their website. You could not clink, uh, clink, click the actual title of advanced uh, rulemaking or mm-hmm. proposed rulemaking, whatever it was in the FTC meeting website, and actually access the report. So you couldn't see this until they released it, mm-hmm. which I thought that was a little shady. Like, that's a little crappy. Yeah, that- it's, it's kind of hard to figure out what they're talking about and be prepared and be informed. Yeah, it's like, oh, our research shows that, but you can't see it. <laughs> nope, I'm not going to do it. We're going to talk first. You can talk when we hand you the magic stick. <laughs> and um, I was just like, okay, so how do we make a comeback? Like, How do we even prepare comments for your meeting if we don't even know what you're concluding? And when you look at – and I, I was able to attend some of the meeting, like the actual – open meeting before the um before they concluded the whole like five minutes of the two-hour process Mm -hmm. Uh, i was able to listen to some of the uh opening comments because of course the meeting had to start during one of my classes and there was another meeting i had to attend uh for school that day concurrently occurring 
with the FTC thing. So I had the FTC playing on my on my Surface, and I had the other meeting going on my uh, uh, on my PC, my workstation. And I just found myself like, what do I even talk about? Because I thought about, you know, hey, why not throw in my, my five minutes of fun here or the two minutes they gave us just to comment on something. But what would I comment on? Like, let me look at their research. Let me pick something apart. And, you know, then I'll prepare comments. And you would think that you would want to do that while you're discussing, do we even bother editing this? Instead of, by the way, we've already come to the conclusion that we're going to edit this, but can we hear you for the next hour and a half talking about why we shouldn't funeral <laughs> service? Um, I mean, it was just like, it was a bum rush. And looking at their own report, this is about convenience. And this that's is really not what unfair. it boils down to. It, it's yeah. not about whether the practice is fair or not. It's do I have to go to that funeral home and talk to somebody or do I have to pick up the phone and talk to somebody? It's more of, can I just go online and click and think that I'm on, I'm going to understand what I'm seeing because that, that to me is the biggest issue with having online pricing is it's not as simple as looking saying, Oh, this could be what the, what the price is. So this is what I need. It's, it's, there's a lot more detail. There's a lot more discussion that needs to occur when you're planning your funeral. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I thought was fun is in the original rulemaking, um, prior to the quote I just gave you folks, the evidence indicates that blah, 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 blah. Right under introduction, it is the, let's see, first, second, that's a semicolon, uh, third sentence. In fact, the purchase of a funeral is the third largest single expenditure many consumers will ha ever have to make after a home and car. So just for the giggles of it, because I'm a troll, um, I jumped on the Toyota website and I typed in Forerunner, a car I would never purchase. Just it's not my style. It's not my thing. I'm no, it's not on the bucket list. And it says MSRP starting at 3285 or 3850 or whatever it was. So then I'm like, okay, well, you know, what if I want extra packages on this? I should be able to just like click the buttons and add my packages and watch the number go up. Nope. Got to contact a dealer. For more information, fill out the form, send it. Okay. Um, let's go look at another vehicle. Let's, let's do that. Let's look at inventory. Okay, so it pulls up, you know, current inventory at a dealer. But that's not the price of that car. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's starting at. <laughs> even if it's used. Even if it's the one on the lot and they say, hey, this one's going to be at $21,995. That's not the price of that car. That's not the price of the car cash price. Because when you get there, you have to pay the tax of the state. You have to pay all the little hidden fees, which was the other thing that they were complaining about at that yeah, meeting. Yeah, trip pricing and such right? and junk fees. So what do they expect of us when they don't even enforce it on the auto industry? And if we really want to start splitting hairs, do people buy more funerals than cars? What's a more common purchase? So if we're going to protect the public, let's protect the public against unfair practices. But let's term unfair as something that is putting them at risk, which is, if you look at the original rule, exactly what it is they're saying is, hey, you funeral directors are acting like total human garbage, and we are compelled to step in to prevent you from playing the stupid human games. And now it's, I don't want to pick up the phone. I should be able to go online and look at pricing and figure something out. Well, if this was a traditional type of purchase maybe that's so i was looking at stupid challenge coins for christmas yesterday on amazon and i can see that they are 29.95 with prime shipping or i can pay um a little bit extra for shipping and get whatever next day delivery okay that's nice that is not you're trying to tell me that purchasing a funeral is the same exact thing as purchasing a challenge coin and if you are to say yes to that, that, you know, I should be able to get a rough idea of a 90% cost. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about something called price throttling. A couple weeks ago, summer officially came to a close. And throughout the United States, major retailers like Walmart, Target, Lowe's, Kohl's, whoever, are dumping all their summer stock. That means all the grills are going on discount. They got to make space for the Christmas trees coming in, stuff like that. 
So as I'm wandering around, because I recently got a, a smoker, I am taking advantage of the fact that everyone needs to dump the stuff off their shelves. So I'll go ahead and take that 50% discount. Turns out that Cuisinart makes a really nice little gas griddle pizza oven thing. They're like $300 retail. And I ain't paying 300 bucks for a pizza <laughs> oven. I'm just not doing it. I'm cheap. So I'm going to wait until the stupid thing goes on sale. So I see them for like 100 bucks off 199 Man, that ain't bad. And then on clearance, because they're blowing them out of the Walmart, it's 147 And then... Am I ever going to use it? Do I really want to spend the money? I could spend that on video games. You know, something like that. <laughs> you have that internal conversation of, do I want the oven more than I want, like, uh, Gotham Knights Deluxe Edition at GameStop or Collector's Edition? And I don't buy it. I'm like, eh, yeah, yeah. You know what? I'll wait to the next paycheck when I have, you know, a little bit more exp- uh, just cash lying around. And I'll pick it up then if it's still in the 147 range. 150 bucks, 50% off. I'll buy it for 50% off. So I go back, get paid, jump on the Walmart app. It's one ninety nine. Eh, I saw it for fifty bucks cheaper. I'm not going to buy it. 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 So I go through the same Walmart, and I'm sitting in the car in in the parking lot, and I go on the app, one ninety nine. I walk inside the store. I scan the UPC. It's one forty seven, and then the Walmart app gives me this little disclosure in there that says pricing at this store. Hmm. Now, Target got nailed for this. Target got nailed for this. That, I mean, it made the rounds on social media a couple months ago that people pull a price online, then get into the parking lot. It's a different price. They get into the store. It's a different price because they're geolocating where you are and giving you different pricing. I do recall that, actually. Mm-hmm. So they're more concerned about us not posting our webs our, our, our prices on our website without citing a single case of misrepresentation, without citing a single thing other than, oh, this is unfair. Because people don't want to pick up the phone. In their own report, I have this highlighted. Let me find the highlight. Um this, this is funny. On page, what page is this? Page five in the first full paragraph, the second to last sentence reads, customers wanting something other than packages would need to contact the funeral provider directly for the firms that are posting pricing on their website. They're posting their general packages because reading a GPL is an art form. Yeah, is an art form. Um, and mind you, it's a very small number of people that are posting their prices on the website. Like I, I can see that, that very few people are doing it. And that's because... Let's be honest, they're probably afraid that posting some of their prices is a triggering event. Now, I don't know why they would do that because it's not a discussion. You're simply advertising or at least, you know, putting your price out. It's not like you are inquiring. A person can inquire by the website. And now, isn't that a fun definition if you want to play with it? Because that's the word that's used by the FTC. You must hand out a GPL when a customer inquires about pricing. And it need needed to be, it needs to be right now, needed to be the face-to-face meeting, which in their own compliance guide says can occur anywhere. Mm-hmm. Parking lot, sidewalk, if they inquire about goods and services, they know you're a funeral director, you're under an obligation before you discuss it, to hand the price list. And there was an interesting comment made by the um, uh, one of the commissioners, the gentleman, uh, about... Well, you don't have to hand it out immediately. Yeah, that that seemed a little bit that contradictory. Was I was I felt a little uncomfortable listening to him say that because I don't feel like he was informed enough on what he was actually speaking about to make that comment because the funeral rule clearly states the moment, the absolute moment that someone says something about the pricing, you need to hand that over. It could be, I'm talking to you while looking at my dead grandma and go, Oh, Hey, how much would it cost you? And nope, you got to give it to them then and there is what it says. And he's saying, no, that's not true. So every one of these people is a Harvard lawyer. 
or I should say Harvard lawyer, every one of these is an Ivy League lawyer. Don't believe me, go read their bios. Every single one of them graduated from an Ivy League school. Many of them, I think all of them now have law degrees. Uh, at least one of them is from Harvard, one of them is from Yale. And the gentleman, I believe, he's a Harvard grad with his law degree from Yale and served on the Yale Law Review. And like a good lawyer, he is stating, essentially, this is, this is the difference between lawyer logic and real life, that a person can come into a funeral home and have discussions with the person without inquiring about goods, without inquiring about services, and without inquiring about pricing. Which is That's realistic. the trigger. Which is realistic in as much as what he was saying, which is a family does not walk into a funeral home and the first thing that happens, Hi, welcome to my funeral home. Here's a copy of General Prices. Please don't sue me. You know, that's not what's <laughs> happening. But there are funeral practitioners out there. Honest to God, there are people out there right now who say, the eighth professor don't know what they're talking about. When you say, no, numbnuts, you don't have to hand the price list just because they walk through the threshold of your funeral home. The rule, the, the, the compliance guide even says you can offer pleasantries, you can offer your condolences, you can offer some words, but before the discussion starts on the protected topics, you must hand them a price list. You don't have to go over it line by line. You don't have to sit there and have them put the finger on the little black pad to see what their mood is. You don't have to do any of that. You just have to hand it over. So what he's saying is, and he said it within that context, is that there are people out there that believe you have to hand the prices before you do anything, and you don't, and that's true. You can offer condolences, and I forget what it says in the compliance guide past that. Normal, um, normal, uh, customary topics, but you can't just go into a full discussion without handing over a price list. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the issue is they're trying to make this convenient and they're using their rulemaking power to make it convenient for shoppers yet. And, and, and they stated this throughout the, uh, throughout their comments that the nature of the landscape has changed. So many more people are using the internet. Well, if you are on the left wing of the political spectrum, you probably think the government should step in and make it fair so that people can see the pricing online because that's fair. But that's not fair within the legal sense. The government just doesn't get to regulate something because they want to regulate it. They can, which is something we heard from the Trump appointee regarding the other two rules, because she said these are stretches. You are lawmaking, and it is not our job to lawmake. It is our job yeah. to rule make. But with ours, it was it's narrowly construed. It fits within the definition of the rule. Let's move forward. We're the, we were the we were literally the only topic that all four of them agreed on, Correct. which yeah. shocked me because after listening to um, the, the, the one, I think that was Commissioner Wilson, tear the other two apart. I'm like, oh, she's going to be the only one that says no. And she was all over this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, OK, well, I can see why she's doing that. But again, these are all lawyers, Ivy League trained. There is a difference between an unfair practice that puts the consumer at risk and a practice that is just inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are drastically turning unfair and inconvenient into synonyms. And that is not the intention of this rule. Not at all. I think one concern that I've always had with the GPL is that despite we can do packages, and I'm not saying a package deal, but the fact that you can mm -hmm. group things and say, I'm going to, you know, what's the cost of my funeral? Oh, this is going to cost you $5,380 for what you're asking for. Okay. I gave you one price. Now I give you the bullet points after that, that say that $5,000 bill is going to account to these bullet points. And this is what's included in that so that it's not confusing. <clears throat> but I think that there is a general sense out there among our colleagues that the GPO means that I have to just give that itemized list and say, well, here it is. And I have to explain every single line and the customer's looking going, what do I need that for? What do I need this line for? I don't understand this. And I do see some level of confusion. And I do think that if you put something online, are we going to be putting an itemized list up there where just because that's the nature of the beast of what people are used to doing, are we going to put that list up there where the consumer is going, I have no clue. It's like your car, you know, thing. 
okay, your tires are going to cost this, the hood is going to cost that, and if you want a mm-hmm. steering wheel, you're going to have to pay for a third item, versus the fact that they just tell you that your car is going to cost you $3,000, $5,000 for your vehicle, because that is the cost. Now, if you want to have your steering wheel replaced, then you now have the upgrade fee of whatever that upgraded tires or whatever the item are. So uh, what is your, you know, that's that's my take on, I think, where the confusion may lie. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I don't think they're going to regulate the pricing. Like they're not going to say, here's how you have to display your pricing on your website. They may say you have to have a pricing section on your website and that you can display your prices however you want. Just like a GPL, you can present your GPL however you want. As long as you fit the criteria, it must contain the words general price list, has the name, address, phone number of your funeral home, has an effective date, has the disclosures, you know, has everything it's supposed to. It's a checklist. How you choose to present that, that's up to you. But one thing for certain they're absolutely going to do, and no one better delude themselves with this, because they're already convinced that this is what they're going to do. Like, there, there is, this is, a, in my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong. And drinking antifreeze has affected my cognizance. <laughs> but there is no reality where they have not decided that they're going to require funeral homes to post their general price lists as they are currently printed or as they are going to revise them on the funeral home website. That's already been decided, I think, by all of them. Well, yeah, it, it kind of seemed like a dog and pony show having the open comments at the beginning because you know that as soon as they got to our topic, they didn't consider any of that. They they knew from the get-go that this is what they were voting to move forward with. <laughs> yeah, something like, you know, Madam Chair, I... Um... I really take exception to the use of junk fees. Uh, on to the next topic. Let's talk to these SOBs that are charging all this money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, it's like, um, hold on. Yep, that that that, that tastes like bias. Uh, so <laughs> it's... It, it, they're going to post these price lists. This is, this is what I think is the absolute most ironic part. This is the part where just the troll in me is dying. And my little black heart is swelling as time progresses. They're going to require us to put these stupid price lists online. And then we're going to be inundated by phone calls and people contacting us and clicking the contact sheet and emailing us because the government's approved form sucks. (laughs) And it's confusing. (laughs) So the one thing they should have done ahead of time is the one thing they don't want to do, but that's what's going to happen more of because unless there is also a subsequent revision on what we can do with the general price list, it means nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, it means nothing. I feel like we're going to see a lot of people that do their online shopping, but then come in person with one idea in mind and are leaving very upset because <laughs> they made up their own pricing and they decide this is how much it would be, not knowing what they need to include and what they don't need to include. Um, so I, I, I'm fully prepared to deal with a lot of Karen hair. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is going to turn into a Karen Chad God boss rush. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be unbelievable. (laughs) Well, you know, I was on your website and it says that your direct package is $69.95, but I don't need the register book, which means this is misrepresentative pricing. I need to speak to your manager. Yes, ma'am, you can go ahead and click on www.ftc.gov and lodge a consumer complaint (laughs) and have all your friends do it as well. Please, let's show them just how smart the American consumer is going to be with reading funeral home pricing mandated by the government and us trying to comply with that. Realistically, what what people actually want is package pricing. They want the convenience of clicking on a button and seeing generally what is something going to cost me. But even looking at a car, building your own Toyota, building your own Mercedes, if you even do that, because I'm not going to visit the Mercedes side. I can't afford that crap. <laughs> you know that that car is not going to be $49,995. You know there's going to be some stuff added to that. In fact, that's probably one of the largest gripes about purchasing a vehicle is the car says it's twenty grand, and when you drive off the dealership, that same $20,000 vehicle somehow miraculously costs $32,000 plus. 
and change. And at least at a funeral home, that doesn't happen. Like the FTC's own report does not state that they found any substantial fraud, any substantial misrepresentation, like none of it. So the first lady that was speaking saying the FTC really should not be able to enforce this rule because the problem is gone. Well, no, and there's 42 funeral homes in the uh, funeral um, rural offender program to kind of prove the proof that there's probably still some need for that. But fact of the matter is, there's no fraud going on. And if there is fraud, they're not catching it, which Mm -hmm. should also scare you because the inspectors can't find it. So why are we putting all this effort into convenience? And this also isn't the boogeyman. Because there's something else in the report that's really demonstrative, which is if they require us to upload our GPLs, it's, this is both good and a bad thing. There's not a lot of variety in how people host their websites. Like there's none. It says that um, third-party support, almost 80% of the 146 websites listed a third-party entity is having designed, built, or hosted the provider's website. So do you know how quick it is for us to go ahead and just fix this if they say, here's what you got to do. The third party website just has to have the link. Mm -hmm. What's also the bad part? The third party website is a third party website. So we have to wait on them to provide that functionality, which this should not be hard because this is their business to deal with web pages. Let's see. And the two biggest ones were uh, Consolidated Funeral Service and TA. Uh, 44, Batesville Incorporated, 35. So one is one of the largest uh, merchandise suppliers of caskets and stuff like that. And the other one, I don't know who the heck they are. But it's a quick fix. They just update their web software. The people that are going to get screwed by this are the little mom and pops that are literally web hosting their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they probably haven't updated their website since 2008 anyways. They've got that... uh... Angel and GeoCities website still. Oh my god, GeoCities. Look at you name dropping. (laughs) (laughs) So, for someone like me who doesn't know much about FTC practices, what happens next? So they voted to approve this. What should we expect? So the next portion of this is that 68-page document that I should have read. Um the uh, advance notice of proposed rule, this is what they're saying. This, 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 was, this was the opening grievance that I had is you didn't send out the rule ahead of time. And the reason why you didn't is because, well, we might just cancel the rule. Listen, I'm not very smart. You know, I'm one of those people like, oh, look, it's freezing outside. Let me put my tongue on the flagpole. I'm pretty stupid. But you don't have a 68-page proposed rule when you're opening a conversation of, do I cancel the rule? No, clearly (laughs) someone has put some thought and time and effort. Yeah. Like, come on. You're killing me. So this 68-page document is proposing what they say, here's what we want to do to the rule, which now is dumped on everyone's lap. And once they post it into the Federal Register – They can go ahead and get their comments in, and then they will decide. The Federal Trade Commission decides, nobody else, what they're going to do with the rule. And right now, that's a four-person team because one of their uh, individuals is out, which means I don't know the process for appointing a commissioner to the FTC, but it, it is under the jurisdiction of the office of the president. So President Biden will absolutely appoint somebody. There are limits to what political parties can do. So part of the FTC breakup is no more than three commissioners can be part of the same political party. So I think if President Biden appoints a Democrat, the Democrats are maxed out. And I think there's right now like two Democrats, two Republicans. So whoever gets appointed, that party is going to get maxed out. That's the most amount of influence. Uh, Fairly certain that's not going to be a Republican. So... (laughs) Looking at some of the stuff in the rule, um, which is the stuff that's way later on that I didn't – they they, they propose questions. So uh, what is all this question stuff at the end? Um, Yeah, I mean there's a lot here in the 68 pages. 
like I'm only at 35 and they're talking about the objectives uh, and alternatives. So this is something that is going to take a lot more reading and analysis for me to even comment on. And there are obviously some things in here that have to be talked about, and they're not wrong. You know, we, we are going to have to modernize the rule because we're keeping the rule. Mm-hmm. So things about like hydrolysis or... Um, Terramation uh, or even yeah, just n- the Yeah, natural organic reduction, stuff mm-hmm. like that. So yeah, clearly we are going to um, have to be looking at it. And I'm most interested to read the summary of comments um, to see what consumers were saying and stuff like that. Professor Finn, how how would you feel about a return spot on the podcast once we've had some time to really read and digest that, what was it, 68-page document? Yeah, yeah, Yeah. 68 pages, light reading. Yeah, you know, bust that out over lunch break today. Um, We'd love to have you back. I think this has been a great discussion so far. Um want to thank you for coming on today and helping educate and give your input we really appreciate it um is there anything that you would like to share or give a shout out for i know that pretty much everyone in my program follows your youtube channel oh my god i'm so (laughs) sorry find some better channels oh no they're great (laughs) I especially love there's been a few instances where you've uh, mimicked us Northeastern people and our Dunkin' Donuts and things like that. And it's it's been a good chuckle. It's been helpful to reinforce some of Professor Sh- Professor Shea's lectures. You, you, you realize I am a Northeasterner, right? Are you really? You're originally from the Northeast? Born and raised. I was born in Lowell, Massachusetts. I was raised in Methuen in Lawrence, Massachusetts before I came to Dang. Uh, Florida. So very familiar with those areas, going to Logan with my family to, you know, pick up people from uh, throughout the United States, Mm -hmm. hated driving to Mm -hmm. Logan because, oh, look, the highway just kind of ends and plummets for 60 feet. Mm. (laughs) Great. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually uh, I'm actually a Massachusetts New Englander. I had no idea. Can't tell by the accent anymore, can you? No, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) Give us a few plugs. What's what's your plugs. YouTube YouTube channel? Do you have anything else going on that you want to share? Uh, nope. I I, I live a pretty low key life, man. Like work keeps me busy. <laughs> so um, <laughs> obviously, if you if you want to find me on YouTube, that's the primary thing that I spend a lot of time on, and that's just YouTube backslash uh, Professor Finn. Real hard to remember. Um, I really don't have a lot of other peers. I mean. I'd throw a shout out to you folks if this wasn't your podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the only other one that I would throw out that um, I, I listen to is uh, Dead Girls Talking Podcast. They're, they're a phenomenal podcast. And I've met the guy a couple times from undertaking the podcast. He's pretty cool. He did a uh, he did a thing with one of uh, our classes here at Miami Day through our other professor. And people just flock to him. He, he does a great, great job. So uh, if I'm going to throw shout outs to people, just, you know, people I knew, I know that do good work uh, and and they do good work. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.mortuarymayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, suggestions for topics, or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime.